Well, welcome back to this final installment called Relationship Cure. I'm gonna ask you to turn to Galatians chapter five because you've gotten so good at finding it. And hopefully not only are you gonna find it in your Bibles, but I hope you're gonna memorize it. Uh, we have intentionally gone over this verse for the last two months. Uh, it'll absolutely change your life. And this verse is the relationship cure for all the challenges that we face. If you don't have a Bible, would love to give you one, but let me put the scripture on the screen. Galatians chapter five, verse 22 and 23 says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. And if, if you're at a Corpus home group or if you're online or right here in the room, real life, help me say the nine words. Let's say them together. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Every relationship is changed by those nine words. And today we're gonna look at the last two specifically and how those two words can help us with conflict in our relationships. Now, I have a very special guest today because I didn't just wanna give you, you know, just a homily on conflict, you know, just kind of an abstract philosophy about how to resolve conflict. I thought I would bring to the stage the person I fight with the most. And so that would help all of us. And uh, it's also the person that I love the most, the most uh, amazing human being on the planet and the person that I love making up with the most after we fight, okay? So real life, would you please give a warm real life welcome to the one and only Rebecca Davidson. <laughs> hey, real life. Thank you so much uh, for helping me today. You know, when we were uh, talking about this and praying through this, we quickly realized we need to do a marriage seminar, okay? Uh, there is no way that we can cover everything about this topic in the time allotted. And Lord willing, we actually are gonna do a marriage seminar uh, this February. And we want you to come and uh, we wanna be as real as we can, just like we're going to be today. Uh, but we realize, you know, very, very quickly that we have a lot to unpack. I mean, this topic could take two hours alone. For sure. So what we discovered is that as we were kind of walking through things we know, things we do, um, people just don't know how to fight fair. Um, a lot of us learned bad habits when we were kids or from our families or, you know, even just movies, like the stuff that implants itself. And so we are, we decided that we're gonna give, married couples, we're gonna give you enough tools to get you to February because it's the most intense <laughs> relationship you're in. And singles, teenagers, you know, we, we're gonna give you enough tools to hopefully help you pick the right person to fight with, okay? So. Yeah, for sure, and we, we need to resolve conflict. And you have to understand that when you start to be in relationship, in any relationship, <laughs> family, friends, coworkers, here's the thing you can count on. If you've got people in your life, you're gonna have fights. You can count on them. And if you don't learn how to fight, how to move past a conflict, how to resolve it, you're in trouble. You've gotta know how to resolve conflict. Absolutely. So, you know, anything worth having, any hobby, any sport, anything you're good at, you didn't get good at it without putting in some hard work. And I think, in my opinion, relationships are the most important thing we do, whatever that is. And yeah. so, so because of that, we want you to take notes, okay? So please take out the notes. If you've <laughs> never taken notes before at Real Life, today is your day, okay? <laughs> uh, and I don't want you to take notes for your neighbor, okay? For the person sitting next to you, oh, this is good. You're gonna be working on this. No, no. Work on it for yourself, okay? So relationships take work, but you've gotta work on yourself. So here's some rules. Take notes for yourself, no elbowing during the message, okay? So just elbowing yourself, you're gonna work on it. And if it's worth anything in life, you're gonna have to work at it. To be fair, I did not elbow while we were writing this. That's so, true, yeah, um, several but, times. So what I, you don't get good without, uh, you don't get the good without the tough stuff. And so, you know, you would never, if, if all we ever did was do safe things, you would never get into a relationship because they're hard. And relationships are a risk. They equal risk because in order to be in a healthy relationship, you have to let someone know something about yourself. And let's, I mean, that's just scary because that person then knows those things about you and they have the ability in an unhealthy situation to use them against you. And so we have to, as Christians, adult, we have to approach relationships with maturity and respect always. And so, you know, I struggle with it because I want to fight with my children. 
I and want you're, you're to be the it. winner, yeah. but I have to approach my children with maturity and say, I'm the adult and I need to bring you to a better place in this argument, despite my inkling. So I found this video um, and I thought, you know what? The whole church needs to see yeah, this. Yeah, and we know this is a heavy topic. And so we <laughs> thought we'd start out with something a little, a little light uh, on conflict that you've probably seen if you watch football. So here's a 30 second commercial right now. Do you want to get food or are you? Ugh. Is yours wet too? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. You have a sunroof open. Uh, I, di I didn't open it. You're Mr. Sunroof. I'm Mr. Sunroof? Yeah, you're always like, let's open the sunroof. I didn't leave it open. Doing the replay? You know. This What Really Happened replay is brought to you by Progressive. One thing no one would challenge, protecting your home and auto with Progressive. Let me get that for you. All right, as soon as we saw this commercial together, Rebecca asked for this for Christmas. Okay, she's like, can we get one of those, please? Uh, I just want to throw the flag and then get the replay done, okay? And uh, matter of fact, let's all be honest. If you're in Corpus Online, right here in the room, how many of you guys would love it if you could have a replay machine in your relationships? Wouldn't that be great? Well, you think so. Okay, now what we're going to talk about today is, is if the goal was winning, then you need a replay machine, but I want you to write this down in your own notes, okay? Uh, and here it is, the goal is not to win the argument. So I'm just gonna be real, you guys, I struggle with this because um, I don't have to be right, but I am not gonna be wrong. And so <laughs> I have to constantly remind myself that in the face of a conflict, Micah is not my enemy. And you know, no matter what I meant to say, and so in a conflict, that's not what I meant. It doesn't matter what you meant because there's a, there's a receiver in that conversation. And so perception is a huge deal in a conflict because it is generally what did you perceive that interaction was. And so I have to remember that it is not healthy or responsible to prove him wrong. And I need to change to things about us our relationship, what are we going to do together? How can I protect us? And then I have to remind myself that the goal is not to win, but to win the relationship. And so that means I have to put myself aside. Yeah, so write that down. The goal is to win the relationship. The we, the us, we are gonna do this together. We are gonna talk this out together because the goal is not, aha, I was right. The replay shows, the sunroof. No, it's more of we are going to win back where we want to be in this relationship. And so how do you win a relationship? Well, the last two words, the fruit of the spirit, the list we just read, the last two of the nine words, you're gonna have to pray for gentleness and self-control and display those in the interaction, especially when you're upset with each other, okay? So where is the source of conflict? Let's start with this. What's the source of conflict? And of course, I know you're probably like, I already know the source of the conflict. I'm sitting next to them right now. Okay, next point. No, uh, you already know the source. Work with them every day. Okay, I already know the source of the conflict. I'm friends with the source of the conflict. That's why we need to read James 4 uh, and look at this in your notes. They're on the screen, verses one and two. It says, do you know where your fights and arguments come from? They come from the selfish desires that war, and I want you to write this in, within you. This is the big idea of today. If you're gonna resolve conflict, you're gonna have to resolve what's happening inside of you. It's a bigger deal of what's churning inside of you than what's churning around you. And he says, you do not get what you want because you do not ask God. So truly, to that point, the, the best place to look for the source of the conflict is definitely within you first. And so, you know, circle those last two words, um, ask God, because we have to ask God, um, what's happening in me that I am meeting this situation with so much resentment, anger, um, fear, whatever the word is that, that inspires a conflict, that generally doesn't come from the interaction. It comes from your perception of the interaction. And so you need to ask God, what's happening inside of me that's making me feel this way 
about this situation. Yeah, so that's step one. What's going on? And not why do they do this? Why do you do that? But it's like, what is happening inside of me? Not what's wrong with me, but what's churning inside of me. And so we thought we'd show you this diagram. It's in your notes. I want you to write three words on this diagram, okay? So here's what, what's going on inside of me. Well, what's going on inside of you is you have this word expectations, okay? That is a big word. It's a big word for why you're dealing with conflict because you expected something to happen in a certain way. In other words, I expected him to be home at six or I expected her to compliment how I took out the trash. <laughs> Did you notice that I lined recycle and waste right up next to each other? And do you see how long our driveway is? Wasn't that amazing? She didn't notice, okay? Or I thought he would notice that I got my hair done, whatever it might be, okay? So you've got expectations. Now write this word at the bottom, reality, okay? <laughs> so expectations is what I thought would happen, what I thought they would say, what I thought they would do. Reality is what actually happened, what I thought, what they actually said, and what they actually did. Now here's the challenge. <clears throat> the distance between those two words, um, what you expected to happen and, and then what actually happened, um, is this word right here, uh, frustration. Yeah, frustration. Man, that's a big gap. And usually these are the size of gaps that I create in our relationships. <laughs> I just go for like a huge gap. Not miss it by, I'm just like, wow, that was yeah. a lot of frustration for Rebecca. He's definitely an overachiever. <laughs> so, but we have to, the, the greater the distance between those, the greater the frustration. Because that's just human nature, right? When you don't get what you want, in all circumstances, no matter how old you are, there's, there's a frustration, there's a disappointment there. And so we have to figure out a way in all relationships, this is friendships, with your children, with your spouse, with your parents, to communicate the frustration in a healthy way. It has to be what's happening inside of me that is met with this particular emotion, whatever that is, that is leading to an expectation that is not matching up with reality. And pretty generally it is, you have the facts, then you have your perception of the facts. Those are both real, but then you have your feelings about the facts. And when all that smashes up together, pretty generally it results in frustration. There's only one enemy and it's not each other. It's not the person you're interacting with. And so in order to have a safe place to lay down those frustrations, it takes the two people in that interaction, number one, to create a safe environment, but number two, to make sure you trust the safe environment. And so your expectations might not be realistic at all. And you have to own that. But the way you're going to own that is to identify what's happening inside of you before you say, you did not meet my expectations. You have disappointed me. Yeah, it's huge. And there has to be a safe place. Well, how do you make it safe? Gentleness. That's right. And self-control and listening, not interrupting, those kind of things. And so uh, we want to give you some language today where you're, if you're not careful, conflict will set you, you know, face off with somebody like, oh yeah? And now you're looking at each other like somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. We're asking you to kind of turn that where you're shoulder to shoulder looking at the problem together. Because as she just said, the enemy is not that person. And so we have a challenge and we're going to look at it together and we're going to talk about it with gentleness and self-control. So in order to do that, there's uh, several things we have to avoid, okay? So when you're frustrated, it's hard to avoid these. And I promise you, everybody listening to me right now, you have done all of these. I've done all of these multiple times, but also everybody listening to me, you have a go-to, okay? In other words, there's one of these that you go to and it is your stress behavior. And conflict is stressful, so when you get under stress, you're going to this one, okay? So let's just see which one you may wrestle with, okay? So here we go. Here's the first one you have to avoid in conflict. Don't be hysterical. Don't be hysterical. No, listen, no pointing, no elbowing, but there are some people listening to me right now and you get hysterical. Listen, if you're trying to communicate while hysterical, you're not logical. And you, listen, hysterical communication is not only not productive, it's actually destructive. You're gonna wound the other person with your words when you're hysterical. Absolutely. When one person starts yelling, what's your compulsion? I'm gonna yell back at you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be louder so you hear me more than you hear you. And so what happens is 
then you're trying to match each other. The volume is raising, the productivity is going down, and the devil is like, now I got you. Yeah. Because if the you're Bible an extra note taker, write this down, decibels lead to destruction. I mean, you got to get the sure. decibels down for sure. For sure. It's why the Bible says anger gives the devil a foothold. They're not kidding. All he needs is a tiny crack and he will put his finger in it and he will prolong whatever that conflict is because now you've introduced anger and anger is an uncontrollable emotion. So how do you close the door on the devil and you open up the door for the relationship? It's with gentleness. Proverbs 15, 1 um, it says, the, the first three words, a gentle answer. Mm. It deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. Yeah, you, you look at this verse, and you're like, that is an easy verse to read, but how do you do that? <laughs> I mean, when tempers are flaring, how are you the gentleness, right? Uh, I mean, how did this, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is supernatural for sure, but how do you get to a gentle space when there is tempers flaring, anger, and, and the yelling, and that kind of thing? And, and so uh, we want to give you some conflict hacks. And so here's one of them, and that is call a timeout, okay? And so you need a break, and you need to give both people permission. And this, you have to talk about this when there is no conflict so that both people have the ability to call a timeout. Now, you can't throw a flag and say, I want the replay right now. You can't do that, but you can't call a timeout. So what is that doing? Well, watch this. They've actually figured this out. Neurologically, when you are peaked out and hysterical in anger, you are not only going to not say anything logical, you are literally, not figuratively, but literally out of your mind for a minute and a half. For 90 seconds, you are crazy. That means you don't need to talk, and we need to call a timeout so you and I can take a break. Now, if you don't give this permission before, the person who's hysterical, right, you call, it, call a timeout, they're going to get hysterical about that. But he said, well, how long do I need to call this time out? Well, at least 90 seconds. But we would encourage you to go at least 20 minutes on a break. And we got that from some uh, scientific study that actually looked at this. Because if you want to be completely calm, you've got to give your body 20 minutes. Because when you've got your heart rate raised and your adrenaline pumping, you're not going to be very realistic or logical in that conversation. So time out. We need uh, 20 seconds. Now, there's certain personalities, listen to me that when somebody calls a timeout and walks away and says, I need a break, your personality will follow them. Oh yeah, no, there are no breaks. We're gonna solve this right now. Where do you think you're going? Now we won't point out who you are, but you know who you are. <clears throat> the reason he's yelling is because that's me. I am that personality. <laughs> so I, when, <laughs> when we are in conflict, I'm a solver. I, I am gonna find the solution. I am gonna find the answer. Uh, we are gonna we are gonna go over this ad nauseum until we both agree with me, and so, you know, and so I I have to I have learned very quickly that Micah needs time to diffuse that because he's a very logical thinker, and he needs to bring all his points in and and you know and spend some time looking within, which I'm not great at, but. I would encourage you, for all the chasers in the world, I'm speaking directly to you, um, use that time not to make your list. Don't build your arsenal in 20 minutes, um, but ask the Holy Spirit to help you. And so what happens is, if you can give the time for everything to diffuse, and I didn't know until I learned that I needed that 20 minutes as much as Micah needed it, because I came back to the conflict more prepared when I wasn't angry. I was more logical. I could, to the point, chase my information and get it articulated in a way that didn't have a ton of emotion around it, but actually had my feelings in a logical, sorted out way. And so pray. We tell you to pray about everything, but definitely in conflict, ask the Holy Spirit to give you a renewed focus about the conflict. So when you walk back into it, this, you are not going to war, you're going to sign a treaty. And there's a very big difference in, I'm gonna continue this fight or I'm coming back to resolve this argument. And it is the difference between 20 minutes and the Holy Spirit helping you. Yeah, and I think it's really important. What are you doing during the timeout? You're not making the list like, oh, well, if they say this, I'm gonna say that. I'm like a flow chart. Like, then if they, you know, it's like, no, no, no. Holy Spirit, help me. Yeah. I love them. We're not getting along. I need your help. I'm only human. So help me 
display gentleness and self-control. Help me to listen. Help me to see them. Help me to love them like you. And so, so I've got to call a timeout. Now, if you like the timeout and you're not the chaser, let me remind you, you got to come back. Okay? You can't call a two-day timeout. <laughs> I'll see you next week. No. Uh, you, you know, 20 minutes. Sometimes if it's intense, maybe 30 minutes. If it's really intense, maybe two hours. Either way, hey, timeout. I will see you right back here in two hours. I'll keep my promise. I'll be right here. I'll be more prayed up. We'll both be more calm. And we want to win this relationship, not the argument. Here, here's another one. If you're not hysterical, maybe you're historical. Uh, so write that down. It sounds like hysterical, but it's different. Okay. There are some of you listening to me in a fight, your memory goes into overdrive. And all of a sudden we're fighting about this and you go, oh yeah, well, last week, it's like last week, how did we get to last week? And then all of a sudden like, oh yeah, well, last month, like last month, my goodness. And some of you are like brilliant. You're like, well, last year, last year. Man, I don't even remember what I had for dinner last week. And we're in last year. And some of you are, I mean, you're like photographic memory, like in 1989. You don't bring history into the present. Keep the conversation and the conflict current. Because if you're always pulling from the past, you're destroying the future of the relationship. So, so you've got to say, hey, look, I'm going I'm to be present in this moment, and I want to make sure I'm not dragging up the ledger, okay? So it's like, oh, we're fighting now? Oh, yeah, watch this. I got a whole ledger, and you did that, but listen, I may have done this, but you did it five times. Matter of fact, that was three months ago. I've got this on this. No, no, no. Put the ledger aside. Look at what 1 Corinthians says in your notes are on the screen. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Let's say this phrase together real life. What does it say? Love, Love keeps no record, record of being, of being wrong. wrong. So you, you, if you're historical, you've got a record. Burn the ledger. <laughs> Just because you can mem- remember what happened last year, congratulations, doesn't mean you need to bring it up. And here's another thing we'll talk about in a few minutes. But not only do we have a history of conflict that we don't need to be bringing up, their transgressions from last month, but also we have a history of rejection from relationships that they have nothing to do with. And if you're not careful, you're bringing up rejection you had from your parents in a relationship with somebody that doesn't even know your parents. You're dealing with a friend and all of a sudden you're, you're taking hurt from another friendship and bringing it there. And if you want your relationships to have a future and win, you've gotta stop bringing up the past. And so stay current. And not just stay present, but truly be present in this moment with this person about this particular frustration and feeling that you're dealing with. So don't be historical. Yeah, so the third one to avoid, write this down, is uh, don't be sarcastic. Uh, Sarcasm Mm. is actually uh, so much more serious than we give it, uh, than we give it credit for, that anyone realizes, because a lot of times sarcasm is a direct or maybe a disguised, but an insult nonetheless. And it is, uh, it's, it's very serious. It, it's, it destroys trust because I got into a relationship with you. I trusted you. I shared something personal with you. And now when it suits you, you're going to take that vulnerability and now you're going to use it as a weapon against me. And that is just plain unfair. And it's, It's manipulation at its core. Now, no one would ever put sarcasm and manipulation in the same sentence, but if you really break it down in the context of a conflict in a relationship, you're absolutely using it to manipulate the other person. Why do we do that? Because it fosters insecurity. You want them to go over here and go, oh, but maybe I, well, what if I, I guess I, And what's actually happening is the speaker is taking something that they know you feel bad about and they're going to throw it back at you as a distraction to now that I feel bad, you're going to feel worse. And so sarcasm is actually super deadly in in a conversation where conflict is present because it's, it's ultimately the most destructive thing because it's killing trust, intimacy, all of the pieces of that relationship. And so I want to clarify for sure, sometimes sarcasm is funny. I'm sarcastic. He's sarcastic. We just are not sarcastic towards one another because if sarcasm comes at the expense of another, if it's only funny to one person, 
then somebody is hurt by that. And so you really have to be very careful that you have a barometer in your relationships for when sarcasm is humor and when sarcasm is hurtful. And, and if it's at anyone's expense, it's never funny. Yeah, be just super careful with sarcasm. And there are couples we talk to that say, oh, well, you know, that's just how we relate to each other. So, uh, having sarcasm really close to a relationship is like having a pet rattlesnake. <laughs> sure. I mean, you can have one, but just somebody's going to say something and you thought, I thought we were laughing. No, we're not laughing about that. All of a sudden there's hurt. The only time you see the word sarcasm in the Bible, Jesus is arrested. One of the false trials, they take Jesus to Herod. And the scripture says that Herod and his soldiers were sarcastic to Jesus. And if you dig into that Greek word, it literally means they were making fun of Jesus. And if you dig in even more, it literally is where we get our word contempt. And what contempt says is not only do I not respect you, I don't care how you feel, I'm gonna say this and I'm gonna wound you with my words. And that's kind of what contempt sarcasm does is it's, it's very emotionally damaging. Look at Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. And it just warns us, it says, thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword. And all of us have had people say things that have hurt us like this. But it says, wisely spoken words can, and just circle this word, heal. That's the goal is healing. But if we're not careful, sarcastic words come out. So how do you go from sarcastic and being, having contempt to, and just, which literally means I I have disregard for your feelings. And how do you move back to, I really care about your needs. And I really wanna interact with you based on your needs. The only way you get there is asking the Holy Spirit for gentleness and self-control with your words. For sure. So if you haven't found your, uh, your stress behavior yet, I've got one more for you. Um, so uh, write this one down. Uh, don't be silent. Mm. So you got, you got really quiet and <laughs> silent. So there are two reasons in a conflict for silence, and they couldn't be more polar opposite. Um, If you are silent um, in a relationship because you are so discouraged, you don't know what else to say. Um, I've had a lot of people tell me, I it's so discouraging to try to make my point. It's so discouraging to tell them how I feel because they don't listen, something like that. I, my encouragement to you is people in the absence of communication, people will write their own story. In a conflict, it will not be an attractive story. And so I would encourage those of you that are silent when you're discouraged to say something like, I want to talk to you, but I'm not even sure where to start. I don't know how I'm feeling necessarily, but I want you to know I want to work this out. I just don't know what to say because at the minimum, it's words. Now, the other silence is when you are silent as a weapon. And if you are silent as a weapon, real life, listen to me, stop doing that. Because what you have effectively said to the person is, I'm not talking to you because you are not even worth my words. There is nothing more hurtful than to say, I have thousands of words at my disposal. They are free and you're not worth any of them. Mm. And so you have now basically told the person, you're not even worth my time. This conflict isn't even worth my time. Your fear, your anger, your challenge, I don't care. And so if you are silent as a weapon, stop doing that. Yeah, it's it's, it's really good. But by the way, she's talking to me. Uh, so if there was one that's mine, like I am the silent guy. I, and, and back er, er, in my early days, I thought I was just being respectful. You know, I don't like conflict and I don't want to upset you, so why don't I just not talk about it? And when I was a kid, I won the quiet game every time. So I'll just play the quiet game. Listen, when you grow up, you can't play the quiet game anymore. So I hope you're hearing us. Conflict is healthy. Mm-hmm. And there's people say, Pastor, oh my goodness, we're fighting. I'm like, congratulations, you're communicating. At least you're talking. Like Rebecca's saying, don't be silent. Don't play the silent game. The only way you're gonna work it out is to talk it out, and the way you talk it out is with gentleness and self-control. Look at how uh, silence affects you. Here's Psalm 28, verse one. This is every relationship in our life. Even with God, we have to talk to him, we have to listen to him, and sometimes he seems silent. Look at this. I pray to you, O Lord, my rock, do not turn a deaf ear to me, for if you are silent, 
I might as well give up. Now, you're going to hear from the Lord. Every time you open your Bible, you're going to hear his voice. But when you are in a relationship, make sure that your spouse, that your friend, that your children, that your parents, that your coworkers hear your voice. And as Re- Rebecca said, maybe it's clumsy, maybe it's hard, but when, if you're going to work it out, you've got to talk it out. You've got to say something and break the silence uh, in order to move toward a place the relationship can win. Now, what we want you to do is go back to these four and look at these four, uh, and, and we want you to identify your go-to, okay? So, so are you hysterical, historical, uh, sarcastic, or uh, silent? Now, by a show of hands, Corpus, online, right here in the room, how many of you say, I'm at least one of these is my go-to. Uh, I go to at least one of these. Would you raise your hand and be real today? Thank you so much. Now you know your homework. All right, so check the box. Now, please do not check the box of your neighbor. Like, oh, you need to work on that one right there. That's what you should have checked, three of them. No, no, just one at at a time, okay? That's what you're gonna work on. And if you're gonna get this relationship right, you're gonna have to work on it. If it's worth it, you're gonna have to work. And so that's how you're gonna work. That's what you're going to lean into, not being hysterical, historical, sarcastic, or silent. Absolutely, but we wouldn't give you homework without some tools uh, to do the homework. So we'll just call these the ABCs of conflict. Um, So the first one is the A stands for ask for and give forgiveness. And so you, you have to be willing to ask, but you have to be willing to give. They go hand in hand. Yeah, and if you're an extra note taker right next to that, the word humility. Uh, even if you have to say, you know, um, I could be wrong, but this is how I'm feeling. Wow, that is powerful because you could be wrong and you probably are. <laughs> but, but anytime we have an interaction, we're always apologizing for like, oh, well, I thought this or I perceived that or, you know, my attitude of this. There's always something you can get forgiveness, but you have to bring gentleness and humility or friends. For sure. And so if we go into the conversation acknowledging that, you know, I, you, we are human, we are fallible, we are not getting this right, it allows for reset and then resolution. And, and way back when we did a, a, another talk on Love Keeps No Record of Wrongs, um, I told you that I will go to Micah and I will say something like, you are not gonna like what I'm about to say, but I need you to know before I say it that I love you more than I'm whatever, angry, frustrated, scared, worried, et cetera. And so I set the conversation with, before I tell you the bad, let me remind you of the good, because the goal is the relationship. And so it is, again, don't wanna be wrong. I mean, I I don't have to be right, but I'm not gonna be wrong. Definitely takes humility to go, "Ah, I could be wrong. Yeah, that's good. Look at this, uh, Colossians 3.13. How do you get there? Well, what are the first two words real life say? The first two words? Be, be gentle. gentle. It's gentleness. Uh, uh, be gentle and ready to circle this word, forgive. So gentleness and forgiveness are best friends. And so when I'm gentle, I'm going to be have a forgiving heart. I'm going to ask for it. I'm going to give it. I'm going to receive it. Don't hold grudges. Never hold grudges. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. That's how you get to forgiveness to remember. And I'm so thankful that God is not historical with me. For sure. When I say, God, forgive me, he doesn't say, you back again? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't we talk about this last week? And so that's the kind of heart God has to give us, a gentle, forgiving heart to say, you know what? I'm not gonna, says, never hold on to grudges. So here's your choice for life. You either can hold on to grudges or you can let go of those grudges and you can take hold of grace. So either hold on to grudges or give grace. And we're encouraging you, obviously, give grace. Now, here's the B. Bring your bandages, okay? We're gonna unpack, this is the biggest idea. If you don't remember anything else, this is the heart of what we're trying to tell you. This concept of I'm gonna bring gentleness to the relationship. If you had a loved one who was hurt physically, they had a, their arm in a sling or they had a hurt toe or they were on crutches, you would be gentle with them because you can see physical pain. And we just wanna remind you that everybody that you see has emotional pain which is why that wound uh, is something you have to attend to in the conversation, especially during conflict. So Titus 3.2 says this, tell them not to speak evil things against anyone, remind them to live in peace, they must consider the needs of others, they must always be gentle toward everyone. For sure. So 
I would encourage you to remember in all of your relationships, even the ones you've been in for a really long time, that everyone was someone before you met them. And so I, I found this illustration um, that, that described it perfectly what I was thinking. So, you know, that tiny little dot is what you know about someone. And maybe the dot's bigger if they've trusted you with more, but that means the hurt, there are hurts inside of people that you may know or you may never, ever know. But as Christians, we have a, responsi- a responsibility to approach the whole circle as if we are working for Jesus. We have to approach their whole lives, the things we know and the things we don't know, from a perspective of Christ. And so we have to ask not ourselves, what do I know about you? But we have to ask God who knows everything, hey, can you help me in this conflict? Because I'm this tiny little dot and they are this big circle and I need help with the rest, God. I need you to produce those fruits of the spirit in me so that I don't bring worse to this complex. Yeah, you're going to ask the Holy Spirit to show you where those wounds are. For sure. um, and so uh, remember who the Holy Spirit is. He's not a, a force. He's a friend. Write this down. This is the definition of Holy Spirit. Parakletos is the Greek word. It means helper, encourager, and comforter. So write those three words down. Helper, encourager, comforter. And so the Holy Spirit, the, the paraclete, literally means advocate, but I'm going to advocate for them and I'm going to help them, encourage them. So by the way, this is a great practical prayer. This is a conflict hack. When you take the time out and you go away, what are you praying in those 20 minutes? God, would you show me how I can help Rebecca? Can you show me how I can encourage Rebecca? Can you show me how I can comfort Rebecca? Now, th- th- listen, I get it. When you're in conflict, comfort is the last word you're thinking about, okay? <laughs> you're like, I'm not going to comfort them. I'm going to slash their tires. That's what I'm going to do. But, but this is totally supernatural Holy Spirit, show me where the wounds are because I'm looking at the tip of the iceberg, but underneath this hurt and this conflict, there's a person who needs my help and they are wounded. Now, here's how that prayer coincides with God's mission. Look at Psalm 147, verse three. This is a description of God in Psalm 147, three in real life. Let's read this together. What does it say? He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. And I just want you to circle bandages their wounds. You are asking the Holy Spirit to to do who he is through you. God, you love this person and they are wounded. You help me bind that wound up. This is powerful and transformative in how you interact with people. Because, listen, if I, had a, if I had a wound on my hand and Rebecca didn't know that and she touched my hand, maybe I'll try to hold your hand. I'll be like, I'm reacting to what just happened. There is a wound You can't see, you touched it, and my response did not have anything to do with you. And know this, 90% of everybody that you interact with this week is deeply emotionally wounded. And that's why those reactions you get on the highway, that's why those reactions you get, I mean, I'm just asking you a question in Target, whatever. This is the reactions, something, I'm wounded. And we're gonna pray, God, help us to bind up that wound so it becomes a scar. Here's my story, but it doesn't hurt anymore. Because this relationship healed and did the work of the Holy Spirit, God is in the business of bandaging up wounds. For sure. Uh, An illustration, um, you know, for us, one of the words of the Holy Spirit is an advocate. And so it kind of brought an example to me that if I walked up to a conflict that someone I love was in, my spouse, my friends, my children, and I walked up to a conflict that they were engaged in, immediately without thinking, I would jump to their defense. I would stand in front of their weakness. I would support them, I would advocate for them. But the challenge is, is when we are the aggressor or even the victim in a conflict, right? We we don't exercise that same courtesy. We don't stand up for those people because when you add anger, Now, all of a sudden, all that advocacy leaves you. And it's like, wait a minute, in this moment where I'm the aggressor, I have to be the advocate because I know the most besides God. I can hurt you the most. And wouldn't I stand in front of someone hurting you 
if I wasn't involved, of course I would. So we have to do that for ourselves. We have to identify the wounds, approach them gently, even when those wounds may, and usually in conflict, have wounded us. And so as Christians, we are charged with the care of others. That's good times and bad times. And when you are the aggressor, I challenge the room to be the advocate, change your A word, be the advocate rather than the aggressor. Yeah. And um, bring the bandages just reminds us the goal is not winning this argument. The goal is healing this relationship. I'm dealing with someone who's wounded with wounds that are beyond me, but God knows those wounds and loves them and I can bandage up those wounds. I am 100% convinced that God brought Rebecca into my life to bind up my wounds from hurts that she didn't cause. And I am 100% convinced that God brought me into Rebecca's life to heal wounds from hurts that I didn't cause. And when we can come back to that place, we're calling you to that place, you're gonna resolve conflict because the goal is, is healing. So this is our prayer for you. It's in Ephesians 4, and in your notes are on the screen. And this is what we're praying happens today. Now, now your attitudes and thoughts must be cons constantly, and just say these four words when we were like constantly what? Changing, Changing for, the better. for the better. So what we hope uh, that everyone takes away from this message is that the way you handle conflict is going to change for the better. For instance, it says, if you are angry, don't sin by nursing your grudge. Don't let the sun go down with you still angry. Now, brief pause there. Sometimes if you're fighting at 10 p.m., go to sleep, take a nap, wake up, start over. So the sun means don't let the ending come. It doesn't mean don't let the day end. So I would encourage you to, to make sure that you are your best self, you're fed and you're rested and then continue the conflict. Um, but say these four words, this is the most important, uh, get over it quickly. Yeah, get over it quickly, uh, hear, hear us. A healthy relationship is like, oh, we never fight. I'm scared for you, <laughs> for sure. okay? That means you're not talking. You're not even interacting. You're gonna frustrate each other. So the goal is not never fight. The healthy sign is when we do, we resolve it quickly. The distance between the frustration and the resolution, that's a healthy relationship. Notice you say, well, how do you get healthy? Well, don't use bad language. Now say the next seven words with me after don't use bad language. Say, say only, only what, what is, is good, good and, helpful. and helpful. Make that a commitment to those who you're talking to and what will give them a blessing. For sure. And then notice the last phrase, don't cause the Holy Spirit sorrow by the way you live. So this really is our prayer for you today is the best way to change the conflict in your relationships. Write this down, change your attitude and thoughts. Yeah, this is our prayer that God today would change your attitudes and thoughts, whatever attitudes and thoughts you brought in here, your attitude toward that person, your thoughts about what conflict is or isn't, uh, your attitude about the circumstances you're in, your thoughts uh, about what the challenge may be, and that you're all of a sudden changed from the inside out and realizing that the goal is not to win the argument, the goal is to win the relationship, the goal is we wanna experience peace, we wanna experience healing, we wanna enjoy freedom, uh, we want to have a relationship that honors God because God is working in us and through us and through us to each other for healing. And so just how, how do you find that supernatural love? How do you change your thoughts, minds? You need God. Human love runs out. A human love we've all been rejected by, but there's a supernatural power called, his name is the Holy Spirit. And he can bring, Lord, bring love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control to me so I can bring it to us so we can experience all that you desire for this relationship to be. And so we're just gonna fix our attention on the only one who'll never let us down, the one who knows you the most and still loves you the best, and that's God. So look at Romans chapter 12, verse two. And, and I want you to see this. How do you change from the inside out? How does your thoughts and attitudes change? Well. I want you to write the first five words of this verse in. Fix your attention on God. 
And today, would you fix your attention on God? If you do, you'll be changed from the inside out, readily recognize what he wants from you, and quickly respond to it. God brings out the best out of you. And this is what we pray happens today. So let's bow our head and close our eyes in Corpus Online right here in the room. Just close your eyes and bow your head. The only reason we're doing that is because prayer helps you fix your attention on God. This prayer is not about the person next to you, not about the person you're in conflict with. It's about where you are with God. And I'm gonna ask you with your head bowed and eyes closed to make a life-changing decision today and to move your focus off of that person driving you crazy, off of the storm you're going through, and fix your attention on the God who knows you the best and loves you the most. And this is the God who'll bring out the best out of you. So let's just fix our attention on him right now. And if you've never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, I'm gonna ask you to do that right now. Listen, friend, your relationships on this earth will never be what they can be or should be until your relationship with God is right. So would you just open your heart to him and whisper a prayer of faith, not even out loud, just in your heart say, God, I need you. Forgive me. Jesus, thank you for dying on that cross and offering me forgiveness. I receive you into my life. Change me from the inside out. I wanna follow you the rest of my life and honor you with all that I do and say, especially in my relationships. And if you just whispered that prayer, you found Christ, if you know him in your heart, can we all just whisper a prayer and just say something like this, friend. Say something like this, follower of Jesus. Jesus, forgive me for thinking the goal was to win. And right now, I want you to win in my relationships by winning inside of me. And just pray to him, God, calm the storm in my own heart so I can weather the storm with gentleness and self-control that's around me. And Heavenly Father, as we whisper that prayer of faith, I ask that right now that your Holy Spirit would fill every heart and every home and fill this church as a family, that we would go out into this broken world and be instruments of healing with our words and what we say, with how we treat people, Father. And I ask God, especially in the people we love the most, that we would be instruments of healing for them. And I count it my privilege and honor to pray that your love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control fill every heart and every home. And that we not only cure and heal, but give us a mission to cure and heal this world. For we ask it in the name of the one who heals us by the cross and the empty tomb and filling our lives, our Lord, our Savior, our best friend and resurrected King, Jesus Christ. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Let's give God a hand for his love and his grace. Hey, come on. Can we keep